when we uh, discussed uh, motions, um, we started actually from a, from a system for which we exactly uh, knew where it is. It was for a particle. For a particle, it was easy to describe uh, uh, motion and uh, <coughs> where the particle is. Um, for a rigid body, actually, it is a little bit more complicated, but it was still uh, still pretty uh, precise description of of position. We just had to say where the center of mass is and how. Uh, well, for, for a rigid body, right? And uh, so, where the uh, center of mass of this object is and how it is, uh, how it is rotated. Uh, well, uh, when we uh, thought about elastic medium, it is that position of individual particle now was uh, described by a pretty complicated function. Um, if... Uh, if we are lucky, then we can actually represent it by a sinusoidal function, which means that the oscillation is going to be harmonic. Now, mathematical properties of sinusoidal functions are such that, um, well, a lot of functions, and particularly functions which describe uh, or, um, oscillations of a medium, can be considered as a superposition of sinusoidal functions. So this is why sinusoidal functions are so important. Uh, because uh, other oscillations can be <coughs> right as that superposition. Um, uh, it's, it's a mathematical trick in a way similar to, to a <coughs> trick which uh, you are familiar with. Uh, you can write a, an arbitrary function as a, a combination of power functions, right? Uh, we call this uh, series what? If we, uh, if we represent a function as a sum or, or linear combination, more precisely, of uh, power functions. What do we call these func uh, the, this uh, series? Yes? What is it called? Yeah, power series, right. And uh, what do we call power series? Well, we, ha you, we have two. Uh, common uh, one with uh, Maclaurin series when we know what is the value of a function at zero and the derivatives at zero. Then, then we can write down the function in terms of power ser uh, Maclaurin series. A more general series are Taylor series. Uh, it is an expansion about an arbitrary point. Well, if we do the same uh, trick with a sinusoidal function, we call these Fourier series. You may say it, Fourier series. Fourier series. Fourier series. Who heard about them? Not many of you will. Yeah, it, it's probably, uh, I mean, somewhere in calculus. Well, today I wanted to go to a system in which we actually don't care where individual particles are. Like my body, for example. In my body, my body is not a rigid body. And uh, how it operates... Uh, uh, I mean, for a description of its operation, we don't really care if my finger is like that or like that, and where the blood cells are, if that blood cells is in which, which limb or in the heart. Uh, <coughs> however, in order for me to operate, I know, I know that I need an in, uh, influx of energy from, from uh, outside. So rather than watching uh, individual particles and describe motion by location of individual particles, we'll think about, well, where those particles get energy. Uh, yeah, because remember that uh, kinetic energy also describes what? Kinetic energy, what do we use kinetic energy uh, for? A uh, what? Motion, correct. Kinetic energy describes motion. I mean, look at the whole picture. Think about it. What did we discuss this entire semester? We discussed just two subjects. Well, three, I would say. What were they? Yes, motion. Yeah. How a system moves. Correct. This was one important subject. Yeah. How it interacts. Correct. 
Right, so uh, with the rest of the universe. So we discussed only motion and interaction and relation be between uh, description of motion and uh, description of interaction. This is what we did through an entire semester. Now, let's review all the, uh, all the laws which link motion with interaction in the order which we discussed. So the first one was, what was the first law? Uh, or relationship which, rela which linked motion with interaction. Newton's second law, correct. How motion was described there? Which quantity is, uh, describes motion? Well, we have only three quantities in Newton's second law, the first version. Mass of the particle, acceleration of the particle, and the net force exerted on the particle. So which quantity describes motion? Acceleration, correct. From acceleration, we can figure out immediately what is the velocity at, at any time, and from that, we can figure out where the particle is at any time. I mean, we will need to know additional, uh, additional uh, uh, values, yeah, like initial uh, velocity and whatever it is, or in velocity at a particular time and uh, position at a, uh, at a particular time. Uh, all right, and what describe interaction there? Force, correct, right? Okay, uh, wait, well, let's not do it in, uh, in order, so let's skip that uh, uh, all versions of Newton's second law, yeah, because now we had a number of versions of Newton's second law, depending on this, what was, how we wanted to describe what, and uh, um, now it was always related to the net force. Uh, however, how we wanted to describe motion, so in, we could describe motion in terms of uh, acceleration, we could describe in terms of momentum, right? Now, we had a different for rotational motion, different for translational motion of an object, and so on. All right, another law which related interaction with motion. Work energy theorem, correct, and what described uh, motion there? Kinetic energy, correct. And interaction? Work. Great. Uh, well, uh, what else? Uh, what, an, another pair of, uh, of uh, description of interaction and motion. And actually we had, again, an, a number of versions of, of work energy theorem. Sometimes we even had a, a, a version in which we mix together interaction with motion. What was the, wh which version was that? Yes, so, so really the quantity, which we would think that describes uh, uh, motion, is not pure, did not purely describe motion, because kinetic energy describes purely motion, right? We have, it is directly related to, to speed. Uh, but we had a version of energy which we introduce, and that energy simultaneously was saying about interaction and motion. What was that energy? Now, because if we take a look at mechanical energy, mechanical energy was a combination of potential energy and kinetic energy. Kinetic energy describes motion, but potential energy, think about what potential energy is. How did we introduce potential energy? What was the purpose of introducing potential energy? So that it, we don't have to integrate every time whenever we want to find uh, interaction. We just have to take difference in potential energies and this gives us the work. So we combine that. Well, this was actually the first system in which we didn't care about where the particle is or how it moves. We, we wanted actually to si simultaneously to talk about kinetic energy and potential energy. All right, yeah, uh, another pair which related motion with uh, interaction was impulse momentum theorem. What described mom uh, um, motion? Momentum, correct? Interaction was impulse. All right, we will learn here also uh, for the systems which we are going to talk about also a pair of kind of uh, description of motion with, uh, with description of uh, interaction. But before we, go, we get to that, I want to introduce uh, several uh, new quantities 
um, <coughs> which, uh, well, today I wanted to talk about one, and uh, the one uh, quantity which, we, uh, which I want to, uh, uh, to introduce today, it, re it really describes motion of a system, uh, kind of, again, like in, a, in a way similar to, uh, to um, mechanical energy. And we are pretty uh, familiar already. We use it for a long, long time. Intuitively, we have, uh, we have even a certain comprehension of this quantity. But if I ask you what it is, I bet that you won't be able to, to, to answer it. Actually, why don't you have a conversation about this physical quantity? I'm talking about physical quantity, which is called temperature. So what, what is temperature. Talk to each other for a while and try to think what is temperature. Yeah, because you heard about temperature, right? Uh, you, 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 f you know that it's comfortable when temperature outside is like today in the 60s and it is very uncomfortable when the temperature rises above 70, 90, <laughs> 70. <laughs> it depends, it's subjective. Yeah, so now talk to each other what is temperature? Yes, you would. Li would you like maybe to comment about it? You would. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so here we have a, f a f first approach to the concept. Oh, the degree. I like it. Yeah, because <laughs> uh, the degree of hotness. Uh, <coughs> I have a problem, however, with this one. Yeah, uh, what's hotness? Yeah, w uh, yeah. I'm, I'm. I think I. I know what 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 he meant. Yeah, it is. What will happen if you touch it? If you touch something? Uh, if you burn, it means that it's hot, and if you don't burn it, it means that it uh, it isn't it it isn't hot. Anybody else? Uh, uh, well, but what does it mean actually that we are burnt or we are not burnt? Or maybe we burn something. Um, yeah, because if we are hot, we can burn than something. Um, <coughs> uh, so, can somebody else maybe uh, add uh, something to to make it uh, a little bit more precise? You would like to do that? Okay, let's have it. <coughs> Is it the average oh well, uh, for a certain system, yeah, it is. Yeah, this is much better um, and, and more scientific, uh, scientific uh, uh, approach that it is a quantity which is associated with the kinetic energy of the particles uh, making that system. But this is already scientific approach, not, not the, the intuitive. Um, well, <coughs> concept of temperature actually uh, um, we could introduce it. I, I like this, this, I mean both actually. The, the, second, the second approach describes it more uh, scientifically, but that hotness, uh, I will uh, uh, actually work on that one. Yeah, by hotness, yeah, because I mean, what does, it, when we touch something hot, what happens? What, what, what do we mean by hot? Yeah. I w my finger would get something that will get burned. And actually, JD recognized properly that my finger will get energy from that other object. Uh, it will get so much energy that it, becomes, uh, that it will be fried. Uh, this is what it, when something is uh, hot, correct. Well, now I want to talk about this energy. Yeah, because really what happens with the energy when systems are brought together determines what is the temperature 
of the system. And, and uh, when we, I mean, in, in a few days, we will talk about the uh, <coughs> uh, second uh, law of thermodynamics, which will say which way that energy is going to flow. So if we, if we touch something which has higher temperature than we do, then the energy on average will flow from that something to our body. If we touch a, a, an ice cube, it is then we will be delivering energy to that ice cube. And the uh, relationship between temperatures of the bodies determine which way that uh, energy is going to flow. Well, in order to have to, uh, <coughs> to talk about that flow, we have to talk first about under what circumstances that flow occurs. It occurs when systems are brought into a thermal contact. We can also call it a diathermic contact. And two systems are in the thermal contact if they can uh, exchange energy without performing, I wrote it, microscopic work. By microscopic macroscopic work sorry by macroscopic work we understand that we observe clearly a displacement of a point at which force was applied uh, so if i squeeze for example something if i think about a piston in a cylinder and if that if i squeeze this piston i mean if i push this piston in such a way that the piston squeezes the system inside, uh, inside that uh, cylinder, well, then I see that piston was this, I mean, the contact surface between the system and the piston was displaced. This is where the force was applied to the system. And there was a displacement, so there was work done. This is macroscopic work. Uh, <coughs> So in a combustion engine, for example, that work is done all the time between whatever we have in the cylinder and the piston. There is work done all the time. Uh, however, there could be work done in, on a such level that we do not see it. If I have one system in which particles have a relatively large kinetic energy, and another system in which the particles don't move. I can bring those two uh, systems together, close to each other, in such, a in such a way that these particles will be able to transfer energy to those particles. So individual particles are going to perform work. And eventually, particles in the first system will move slower, they will lose their kinetic energy, particles in the other system will gain kinetic energy. Now, the only way to transfer energy from particle to particle is that the, that the one particle perform positive work on the other particle and the second particle perform negative on the first particle. Well, however, if we have zillions of those particles, we are not going to calculate that work. Rather than that, we say that they transfer energy uh, in a random way and that random way of energy transfer is called heat. So heat, like work, is a form of transfer of energy. Well, therefore, uh, what is the unit of heat? A what? Kelvin, Kelvin no. Celsius, no. Joules, it's work. Heat is, heat is the same thing as work, except that it's done on a different level. If it is done on the macroscopic level, we call it work. If it is done on microscopic level between the system, we call it heat. Uh, all right. There are three mechanisms of heat transfer. So one system can transfer energy to another system uh, through uh, three uh, mechanisms. The first one is thermal conduction. I mean, actually it doesn't matter how you number it. But one of them is thermal conduction. And thermal conduction requires that 
two systems. Let's, so let's say that this is one system. Here is another system. Those systems have to be in contact with a third system which conducts heat. And uh, we have a number of substances which actually conduct heat pretty well. What are they? Metals. Metals conduct heat very easily. If you heat up one end of the rod, the other end of the rod will become hot pretty soon. There are substances uh, which uh, don't have this property. We use the, these substances, for example, to insulate our houses. Uh, we want uh, uh, we want actually to to, uh, to to have such a substance that does not transmit heat f from outside to the inside. Yeah, when it is hot outside, or the other way when it's really cold outside. Uh, <coughs> all right, so. Yeah, when the when uh, and during during conduction, heat is being transferred through that uh, through that substance connecting the two systems. Uh, law of thermal conduction actually says uh, how much heat is being transferred. Uh, if I uh, I mean obviously it is going to be proportional to the amount of time. Uh, we can also uh, think about just a rate at which heat is being transferred. So, if uh, we if we consider a certain surface and try to figure out how much energy flows through this surface, the amount of energy flowing through this surface per unit time, in other words, the rate at which energy is being transferred through uh, through this surface is. Uh, let, let's, uh, is proportional to area of this surface and, well, <coughs> difference in temperature divided by the distance in the direction of that, of that, uh, of that motion. And uh, there is a certain propor proportionality which is called uh, thermal uh, conductivity. More precisely, actually, if we think about uh, uh, this expression, uh, this expression over here, well, it is that I selected vertical axis as the x-axis. Uh, more precisely, heat is going to flow, or which direction heat is going to flow, and how fast is, is determined by this quantity, which uh, I think we have already introduced in the past. Uh, uh, yeah, it is that if I know the distribution of temperature in space, uh, I calculate this quantity by taking, uh, well, having x, y, and z component. This is a vector quantity associated with the distribution of, oh, let me go to the other side, with the distribution of uh, <coughs> Uh, of temperature in space. And when we calculate the, co the components, x component is equal to derivative of the distribution with respect to x, y component is the uh, uh, derivative with respect to y, and z component is derivative of the distribution of temperature with respect to z. Uh, what do we call this vector? We have already used it. Gradient, correct. When did we use concept of gradient? It's the second time that we, that we are bringing a concept of gradient, although for completely different purpose. But this is a mathematical concept uh, which, uh, which is very important and actually you will talk about when you get to Calc 3, you will study it really thoroughly. You will calculate gradients for a number, large number of various functions. Uh, and after Calc 3, you will be very skillful in finding gradients. Uh, you will have intuition for it. But uh, now let's recall when we had gradient in the past. Anybody recalls that? Well, it was a gradient related potential energy with the conservative force. With the yes, a conservative force was opposite to the gradient of potential energy. All right. Uh, 
Now, uh, I forgot, yes, we have already conce concept of an area, kind of an area with an arrow. Obviously, it isn't area. Area is over here. Uh, now, this vector is, is a, uh, it's a vector assigned in such a way that uh, abs mag magnitude of this vector is equal to the area and the vector is oriented perpendicular to the surface. What do we call this uh, quantity then? We, we have already defined this quant, I think. Maybe not. Well, this type of a, of a vector is called a surface vector. And surface vector simultaneously tells us about the orientation of a vector and, uh, sorry, of the surface and its uh, uh, size. Yes, yeah, so if I have a surface, for example, take a surface. If I want to figure out how it is oriented, yeah, because I mean, orientation has direction, right? So what is the direction of this surface? Yeah, probably you can say that way. Yeah, but I mean, if you if you uh, if somebody asks for directions and you, s yeah, I mean, like uh, what is what is direction to St. Louis, and somebody tells you like that, you will be still confused. You have to point it in the particular direction. Well, uh, the simplest way to describe the orientation of direction is not to use directions which are in the plane. It is better to use perpendicular to the plane. Yeah, so if you choose this perpendicular to the plane, then you will say that the orientation of this surface is like that. And uh, now, a uh, surface vector is defined in such a way that magnitude of that vector, in other words, if I geometrically represent it by an arrow, then the length of the arrow will have to be related to the area of the surface. Make sure not to confuse words area and surface, which are very commonly confused. All right, the second mechanism of heat transfer is, which I wanted to bring up, is called convection. And in convection, it is that, uh, well, we transfer energy from one system to another system by moving hot stuff from one place to another place. So, uh, for example, if we have uh, cold air over here, which I represented by those blue uh, dots, uh, air which grabs, which is heated up by this uh, uh, system, uh, gets there and, uh, and is mixed with that cold air, it will increase the temperature of the air over there. This heat is uh, this heat tra uh, transfer. This mechanism of heat transfer is called convection, and uh, uh, <coughs> well, in the w weather systems, actually, uh, um, I mean a lot of, of energy is being transferred between one part of an atmosphere with to another part of the atmosphere due to convection. Hot air gets into Kansas City, so we will gain uh, energy. I mean, the air uh, in Kansas City is going to gain energy through convection. Uh, well, convection could be either natural, and natural convection occurs whenever we have a, gravi a gravitational uh, field, and uh, when, uh, when the system changes the de density with temperature. You probably heard already because I, I know that, that when we discuss balloons, for example, hot air balloons, you knew how they operate. Why hot air balloon loses uh, density? Because when we heat up the content of, that, of the balloon, uh, that air, it expands and some of it escapes, right? So density, density of the hot air in the balloon is lower than, than the density outside. This, where, this is the origin for buoyancy. Uh, now, if we cool down air, it shrinks. So uh, 
density is going to vary. And if density is varying, uh, <coughs> then the buoyant force is being exerted in nature. So uh, really natural convection results from buoyancy. Um, <coughs> but it doesn't have to be in air. Water also has property that it changes density uh, depending on temperature. And because of that, some uh, water moves up, some water uh, moves down. Now, in case of air, uh, it was that increasing temperature decreases uh, density, uh, which always make hot air to move up and cold air to move down. In case of water, uh, this is not the case. Uh, there, uh, there are ranges, I remember precisely, between uh, zero degrees Celsius and four degrees Celsius, uh, temperature and density are proportional. I mean, increasing temperature increases uh, density of water. The water shrinks, which is actually very important from biological point of view. It is that we wouldn't have um, we wouldn't have any fish. And life would probably could not develop because it developed first in water uh, uh, <coughs> if uh, water didn't have this property. Because now when temperature drops to the value that uh, uh, water freezes, that frozen water, the ice, is lighter than the uh, liquid water, so rather than dropping on the bottom, it floats on the surface. And because of that, water at the bottom is warmer than at the surface in winter. All right. We can also have forced convection. And uh, forced convection is the <coughs> well caused by various types of fan of, of pumps, which, which force uh, uh, hot system uh, uh, to um, hot hot fluid to move from one part to another part. We have it. We use it quite often. Where? In in the in our house, correct. The heating systems in our house use force convection. Although in the past, actually, there were systems which used uh, uh, natural convection only. Uh, <coughs> Now, when we, when we transfer heat from one uh, location to another location, the amount of heat is really related by the amount of substance which is transferred from one location to another location and by how much that substance changed its temperature. We will come back to this formula uh, and, and discuss it more thoroughly. And some of you, I'm not sure if you already uh, have uh, experiments in the lab about uh, thermodynamics or not yet. The third mechanism allows us actually also to live. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Taylor? Oh, sure. OK. Uh. <coughs> Oh, let's try actually, yeah, because now I recall, I think I had the simulation for that. I hope that it is there. Yeah, okay. Uh, he here is an, uh, a simulation which shows, uh, shows convection. And indeed, I made the simulation as uh, uh, I, I used uh, uh, interactive physics. And this is a hot system, and this is a cold system and I think that uh, okay let's run it to see convection so hot system actually I mean this one right now has a zero temperature and now you see how by convection the uh, heat is being transferred um, <coughs> you see yeah, so, so this hot hot molecules from this side flow to the other side and make the other side also to, uh, well, to transfer the uh, uh, energy over there. 
Do you understand that? <coughs> I think that I, I, I probably also had a simulation for the previous one. Let me check it. Yes, this will be how actually heat is being transferred uh, th uh, through conduction. So in order to make uh, heat transferred through conduction, this wall has to be a, a conductor, which means that it has to be able to grab energy from hot uh, particles and transmit it to cold particles. Uh, let's run this one. Uh, look at this particle over here. Yes, and now this is an example of heat transfer through conduction. This wall transfers energy because, well, indeed, in order to transfer energy, it has to part these partic particles in this wall in the conductor have to be able to, to, to grab energy from that, so they will have to move faster. Uh, all right. So, oops, uh, let's now go to radiation. Not here. The third mechanism is uh, radiation. And <coughs> this is how we get energy from the sun. Energy is being transmitted from the sun, and uh, uh, flo it, it, it flows through, uh, through vacuum. Uh, it flows because really that energy is associated. We will learn this in the, uh, in the future, um, next semester, about electromagnetic radiation. And what happens is that the sun causes electric and magnetic field on Earth to oscillate. And oscillations of electric and magnetic field can cause oscillations of charged particles over uh, on, on, uh, on the ground. Uh, one of those, actually, I mean, the, the uh, evidence uh, of, uh, of absorbing energy through radiation is our vision, because eye has a property that that it is capable of reacting to electromagnetic radiation with a particular uh, frequency. Um, now, the amount, uh, the amount of energy which is uh, emitted from a, a surface of a, of a warm object, and every warm object actually emits it. Our bodies do that too. And, uh, and because our bodies do this, uh, we can have night vision. Uh, I mean, <laughs> those people who are, uh, who are seen probably are not particularly happy about it, but it is that in the darkness we can see a person using night vision because we all glow. We glow. We don't glow sufficiently, uh, I mean, in a range so that we can see it with our eyes, but if we make an electronic device, we could see each other. Uh, uh, how much heat is being uh, emitted from a, from a surface is described by Stefan Boltzmann law. And uh, in this law, well, this coefficient over here, it's, it's a certain constant. Uh, it is called uh, uh, Stefan's uh, constant, and it has such a value. A is the area which emits. Um, so if I, for example, if I think about how much heat is being emitted from my face, I will have to put this, the area of, of the surface of my face over here. E is, a, is characteristic of the substance, uh, so I will have to use uh, emissivity of the skin in order to figure out what is, uh, how, it is, uh, how much energy is being emitted. And T is the temperature of the, uh, of the uh, source, whatever temperature is, because we will talk about temperature in a moment. 
Uh, so actually, you can see that, <laughs> well, because our, our temperature is relatively low, so the rate at which we emit uh, thermal energy is relatively small. However, the sun has much higher temperature, and therefore, uh, uh, therefore, uh, rate at which energy is being transferred from um, from the surface of the sun is uh, much uh, higher. Um, at this point, maybe I can I just borrow your cup. Uh, <coughs> yeah, because this device. I mean, it's a it's kind of ingenious device. It is designed in such a way that uh, it's, yeah, because, I mean, what did you use it for? Coffee. Coffee. And now, what did you want about that coffee? Stay warm. Stay warm. Yeah, throughout entire class, uh, throughout entire lecture. And uh, it is designed to suppress all three mechanisms of uh, heat transfer. I want you to talk about it. How is it suppressing all three mechanisms of uh, heat transfer? Talk to each other now. I will, I will let you, I mean... <laughs> Anybody would like to, to comment about particular mechanism? How about you, Emily? Would you? Which, which mechanism did you discuss here? Um, well, I thought it did the um, convection because that had like the wall in between and that'd be like the outside surface. All right, yeah, the convection was suppressed and Emily says, well, it means that it prevented motion of charge uh, of, of, of particles within the wall. And actually, how was it prevented? Well, it was a solid over there. I actually, uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit about convection because I heard uh, another group talking about uh, another device which is even more uh, efficient than this cap in which convection is suppressed by something else. I, th I think that you were talking about it. Yeah, what was, uh, what so say about what, what container you were talking about and how convection was suppressed in that particular, uh, uh, I mean, convection in the wall. It was, yeah, because over here in this cap, this cap has a relatively large, uh, I mean, thick wall. And in that wall, convection is suppressed. Yeah, in the wall, well, it's, it's made of a solid. So in a solid, uh, uh, charge, uh, no, no, uh, the particles cannot move from, I mean, back and forth between, yeah, like, like for example, in a window, uh, <coughs> between the two, two pieces of glass. And if it is hot over here and cold over there, well, then we will have convection between the two uh, uh, pieces of glass. Uh, and... Uh, <coughs> That way that the gas in the, in the window moves heat from hot side to cold side. Here we don't have this motion because it is made of a solid. But even better than a solid is a vacuum, a vacuum correct, in a, in a dual flask, yeah. right? So over there we have an empty uh, space. So nothing can transfer that energy. You had a comment? Uh, okay. All right, so that way we, we took care about convection. Let's look for something else. 
Anybody would like to, to discuss uh, conduction and radiation? Okay, so how about a co conduction? It's got a, it's got a very small footprint. Oh, uh, well, no. I disagree because, I mean, still, this wall is, uh, is yes, yeah, so, so, so practically all area of the fluid uh, is exposed to the wall. Actually, we have to do it in a different way. Uh, it's, uh, yes? The material on the inside of the cup is not conductive. Correct. I mean, it looks like it is made from metal, but it is not. I mean, it's too light for a metal. It's made from, from plastic, which has relatively high, uh, low, uh, low uh, uh, thermal conductivity. Uh, actually, inverse of conductivity is referred to as an R value. And if you go to buy uh, insulation, you will, you will ask for R, R value. So R value for the material from which this cap is made is high. It resists heat, tr uh, heat transfer through conduction. All right, now how about radiation? It's probably not that trivial right now because uh, <coughs> uh, we... Uh, we don't know what happens with radiation. We haven't discussed with that. But if we have a mirror, the mirror sends back light. Right? If light falls on the mirror, it is reflected back. Uh, so mirrors don't, tra don't transmit radiation. They send it back. And <coughs> these... It's not coincidence that this, these caps are so silvery. It is to prevent uh, heat uh, transfer uh, due to radiation. So if this silvery surface reflects, I mean, if the heat is trying to get out, it reflects it back to the cap if we want to keep the, uh, the content warm. If we want to keep the content cold, then the radiation coming out from the outside is reflected back to the, uh, to the uh, uh, outside. All right, so this will be all for today. Thank you very much, and see you tomorrow. So is that the same reason why you microwave explosives and you put metal into it? Because it's reflecting back the radiation back onto the microwave?